Okay, there we are. We got the video going, and again, it's good to have everyone here for our first gathering. Uh, Bible Believers Cowboy Ministries is kind of what I called this when I first moved up here and uh, a year and a half ago, and began to try to do some Facebook Live messages, and and then I got sick and couldn't do that, and uh, and so uh, it's a uh, it's a great blessing and encouragement and a help to me. Uh, to be able to do this on Sunday morning. And I appreciate you all being a part of that, uh, our first meeting, and hope it's the first of many to come. Our purpose, uh, well, go with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2, if you have your Bible. And uh, I'm learning and looking. I almost also need to say if you have your Bible or you have your device, uh, because people use their phones and their pads, and that's wonderful. I try to tell myself to, 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 to remember to say turn left or turn right, and sometimes I also have to say scroll left or scroll right, and, uh, and so that's okay. But we're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I want to read the first uh, seven verses, and then we're going to zero in on the end of verse 3 and, and verse 4, and we're going to kind of talk about uh, uh, what's, what's our purpose, what is it that we want to accomplish, what is it that we want to uh, see happen uh, through this Sunday morning ministry uh, here in the Spruce Creek Pavilion and wherever, uh, whatever location the Lord may take us to, but as we meet here now for this time being. Uh, so what is our purpose? Why are we here? And we'll answer that as we're going through the message today. But I'm going to re begin reading at chapter 2, verse 1 of 1 Timothy. Again, I'll read down through verse 7. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Of course, this letter in 1 Timothy, this epistle, was written to uh, one of uh, Paul's uh, uh, converts in Paul's ministries. Uh, Timothy was... Uh, uh, the one that Paul encouraged and commissioned, as you read 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, uh, Paul was, or Timothy was Paul's son in the faith, and he was the one that Paul uh, was kind of passed the mantle to, so to speak, uh, as he writes in 2 Timothy and, and tells Timothy, he says, the time of my departure is at hand. And so Paul writes 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy toward the end of his life, uh, and, uh, and he's instructing Timothy and encouraging Timothy to be faithful in the truth of the Word of God and, and to be preaching and teaching certain things. And so as he does that, we, uh, we realize what he's saying there. And uh, so we pick up again at verse 3 and 4, and I want to pull uh, this passage out of the context that we read, and we're going to focus on two things that we'll find here. So he says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so we read that again. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so we ask the question, well, what is God's will today? People are often uh, believers and you know, young people especially sometimes or as difficulties come in life and changes come and moves take place and different events of life, we, we ask the question, what is God's will? And what would God have me to do? And the answer is really not as difficult as some folks might want to think or seem to think or may have been taught to think. Uh, you're not going to get some tingly feeling up the back of your neck. You're not going to hear some voice whispering in your ear. Uh, we get the answer to what is the will of God in the Word of God. He reveals to us His will uh, in the book. If I want to know what God's saying today, I need to read the Bible. If I want God to speak to me audibly, then read the Bible out loud. <laughs> 
And that's how God works today. He speaks to us through the written words of God, through the words on the pages of this book. And so I read in here where he says, God our Savior who will have, and then he gives us two things, all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so I, I, I want to try to find an analogy. I may not be able to do this every Sunday morning, but this morning I wanted to do a little bit of an analogy that most of us will identify with. At some point in our lives, we wanted to become horse people. You might have been a five-year-old little girl or a 15-year-old person or a 20-year-old or 30 years old, or you might have never had horses your whole life and you got 45, 50, 55, and you got financially to a place, and here was something you always wanted to do. And so uh, you moved to Big South Fork and you bought a horse. Mm -hmm. and, but at some point in your life, uh, you acquired that first horse. How many of you remember your first horse? And so when you get that first horse, then uh, you are now a horse person. You have a horse. That's a, that's a moment, that's an event that takes place in your life. To this moment, this hour, you were not a horse owner, you were not a horse person, you go buy that horse, the next hour, guess what you are? You're now a horse person. You own a horse. So it's a one-time event. But now, the next thing that follows that is, how long did it take you to learn about that horse? Forever. A long time. <laughs> And uh, even those of us who are long in the tooth and been fooling with, fooling with horses for a long time in our lives, uh, then, you know, we're still learning. We admit we're still learning things about horses. Well, the same thing, that's, what's called, that's what Paul's saying here about our relationship with the Lord and our understanding of the Word of God. He says, God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. Well, that's the purchase of the horse. Uh, my son and... His wife and, and Stephanie and Caleb, they're, they're friends that are with us. They're mountain bike people. One day they weren't mountain bike people. The next day they bought a mountain bike. Now they're mountain bike people. Now we're broke. Now they're broke. <laughs> yeah. Whenever, we, whenever we'd be in the hay field, my son would always say, Dad, this is why I don't have horses. Or we're mucking stalls or something like that. And so he'll often tell us that... Uh, uh, he, he rides his bike and it costs him to buy it and to keep it up. But when it's sitting in the garage, it doesn't cost him anything, you know. And when ours are sitting in the garage, they're still costing us. Uh, so whatever, you know, you may be a motorcycle person. And, and I know a lot of situations the wife rides and the husband's a Harley dude, you know. And so whatever your thing, you know, uh, there's a moment we weren't and then, and then we acquire that thing and now we are. And so that's the way it is with salvation. Uh, we were born as lost sinners, and there must come a time and an event, a, 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 a moment in time, where we realize we're sinners, we cannot save ourselves, and we trust what Christ did for our eternal salvation. Uh, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And He tells us there in verse 1 or 2, that's the gospel of our salvation. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. You go back and read Romans chapter 3, 4, and 5, and Paul gives a doctrinal dissertation of the gospel. In Romans chapter 3, he tells us we're all sinners. In Romans chapter 4, he tells us at the end of that chapter, uh, he, of course, he's talking about justification by faith in God's promise through Romans chapter 4. You get to the end of Romans chapter 4, and Paul says uh, uh, that uh, he was delivered for our offenses, speaking of Christ, he was delivered for our offenses, was raised again for our justification. We go on to chapter 5, verse 1. He says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And so religion fouls up the doctrine and the truth of the gospel. They add a bunch of stuff to it. They mix it up so that sometimes we're concerned or we're, we're struggling with salvation. Uh, as a young man growing up in Oklahoma, I had a, a mixture of Pentecostalism and a mixture of Native American influence and, and all these things in my life. And my understanding of the gospel as a 12, 13, 14, 15-year-old boy was, you believe on Jesus, but then you got to live right. Well, guess what? 
I never could pull an off the living right. How about y'all? And again, I can remember about 13 years old, I made a conscious decision. I'm no good at being good, but I'm real good at being bad. And so that's what I did. And uh, I believe that I had inherited all the bad juju from all my ancestors. You know, so it was just determined that I was going to be a bad guy. And I got in a lot of trouble. And I was sent to a boy's home here in Tennessee. And it was there for the first time in my life I heard the gospel. That it wasn't what I had to do in order to be right with God, but what Jesus had done on my behalf so I could be right. It's a wonderful thing to hear and to understand that your salvation does not depend on what you do. Because if your salvation depends on what you do, you're going to be frustrated and disappointed and wondering. And every night when you lay your head on that pillow, you're going to wonder, did I do enough today that if I died in my sleep, that I'd go to heaven? You're always worried. You hear somebody say, I'm trying to go to heaven or I'm working hard to go to heaven. And it doesn't have to be that way according to the gospel that's presented for us today that you find in Romans 3, 4, and 5, in 1 Corinthians 15, and of course many other places in Paul's letters. But the important thing I want us to understand here is the will of God that all men be saved. And so if you've never had a moment in your life that you've trusted Christ and Him alone as your Savior, it doesn't require for you to walk an aisle. It doesn't require for you to cry a bunch of tears. It doesn't require for you to try to remember every sin you ever committed and ask God to forgive you of all those things. It's simply an understanding. I'm lost. I can't save myself. And the Word of God tells me that Jesus did it all and all I have to do is trust Him. And you trust Him. And it's as simple as that. You can do that sitting where you're sitting, right here and now, and simply trust Christ. And it's the will of God that all men be saved. And so, well, now, what do I do? I'm a believer. I know I'm saved. Brother Sam, I know there was a day and a time and a place in my life when I realized I was a sinner, I couldn't save myself, and I trusted what Jesus did for me for my salvation. For me, it was a Sunday night in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Bible Baptist Church, November 5th, 1972. I can remember it very clearly. And I won't take the time to tell you all the details, but, but God rescued me on that night. And so you realize as a sinner, and you, you trusted Christ. So many of you sitting here, you know that you're a believer. You don't question your salvation. You know if, if you had a horseback accident or a car wreck or something happened to you today, you have no concern about where you're going to spend eternity. Well, that's a wonderful thing. And so what do I do now with God's will that all men be saved? Well, that gives me a responsibility. My responsibility, and I find that, and let's turn over to, uh, uh, let's where I want to go. I want to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Turn back to your left, or scroll back to your left, to 2 Timothy, or excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Make sure I'm in the right place. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So God's will is that all men be saved and then come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so in order to be saved, if you haven't been saved, simply trust that what Christ did for you was enough and, and trust Christ as your Savior. In Acts chapter 16, we have a story of the Philippian jailer. And the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they give a simple answer. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so that's the simple answer. And so for us who are believers, then what are we to do? If it's God's will that all men be saved, so then we have instructions about that. We have a commission. We have a ministry that's been given to every one of us as believers in the gospel of Christ. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe, begin reading at verse 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, excuse me, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And y'all don't know how hard it is for me not to go back and explain all through there. But uh, we'll do that on Monday night. I've got to keep moving in order to get us out of here. All right. All right. And so he goes on now, verse 17. 
Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And here it is. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. And so as believers in Christ, having trusted Christ as our Savior, knowing that it's the will of God that all men be saved, and we put our faith and trust in Christ, and He saved us, then now we know that we have an opportunity, we have a ministry, we have a responsibility as a saved believer in Christ. And that ministry, the Scripture tells us, is called, in verse 18, that Jesus Christ hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now that's a big old long $10 word, isn't it? Reconciliation. Well, let's keep reading. Maybe we'll understand what that means. Verse 19. And so he says, to wit, which simply means that is to say, or in other words. And so to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And so this idea of reconciliation, it's to be reconciled, to be brought back into union. In other words, you've got two parties, and there's a problem between these two parties. And so as we talk about the spiritual thing, you got God and you got us. And so uh, our sin separated us from God. And then uh, our ignorance keeps us from knowing God or, or our own rebellion, our own sinfulness, our own willfulness, whatever it might be. And so way back there, 2,000-something years ago, on that bloody cross, Jesus Christ was delivered for our offenses. Christ died for our sins. What does that mean as we talk about reconciliation? That means that God was in Christ, as He says right there in verse 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So what happened 2,000 years ago? Jesus Christ on that cross took all the sins of all mankind upon Himself, and He became the sin offering for those sins. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 tells us that the wages of sin is death. We're all sinners. The wages of sin is death. Then he goes on at the end of Romans 6.23 that says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so again, as we're looking at verse 19, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So what I want to tell you this morning, according to the Word of God, is that for every lost sinner out there, Jesus Christ paid the debt for their sin, and God the Father was satisfied. Romans chapter 3 uses a big long word called propitiation. God was propitiated. He was satisfied. His righteous judgment that the wages of sin is death was satisfied. Jesus died that death. And so He reconciled the world unto Himself. I like to say it like this. God's not mad at you anymore. That's good news. When you go talk to somebody that you know that's lost and that does not know Christ as their Savior, and, and I'm talking about, you know, old heathen folks, and I'm talking about church folks, because, you know, there's a lot of church folks that's lost. They're trusting in their religion. They're trusting in what they're doing. Uh, they're trusting in their good works to get them to heaven. And so whoever you may know, if they can't give a clear, clear testimony, there was a day and a time and a place where I trusted Christ alone as my Savior, then that person is probably lost. And they need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. And He says that He's the Savior of all men, especially to those that believe. And so as you go to that lost person, you can talk to them, whether they're religious or non-religious, whether they're church-going or whether they're just old heathen pagan folks, you can go to them and you can say to them, God's not mad at you anymore. i got good news. That's what the word gospel means. Good news, glad tidings. God's not mad at you in the mo anymore. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died and took your sin upon Himself and paid the penalty for your sin. That's a wonderful thing to know. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to share with somebody else. The greatest word I ever got in my life was when somebody told me I didn't have to live right to be right with God. All I had to do was trust Jesus Christ as my Savior and He would save me and make me right with God. 
That's wonderful news. And that's Scripture. And that's where we're headed. And so again, all men to be saved. I've been saved. What's my responsibility now? I've been given the ministry of reconciliation. Now verse 19, he says, He's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. And that is that God was reconciled to the world when he took, when Jesus Christ took all of our sins upon him 2,000 years ago. You can, God's reconciled with you. But it takes two parties for a reconciliation to be complete, doesn't it? And so one has to be reconciled to the other, and then the other has to be reconciled to the one. Well, that's where the gospel comes in. And so he says, again, now verse 20. Now then, we are, rec we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And so this, what, he's t what he's bringing it down to is, in verse uh, 19, God's not mad at you. Jesus paid your sin debt. Your sin does not keep you from God. Your sin debt was dealt with. And so you hear that, and then your response is, if my sin debt was paid, Jesus loves me, He died for my sins, and all I need to do is trust what He did for my salvation, I'm going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and trust Him for my salvation. Now, at that moment you believe, guess what? You have now been reconciled to God. And so verse 20 talks about God's reconciliation to us through the work of Jesus on the cross. And then verse 20 tells us that uh, as Paul says there, as though at the end of the verse, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So God's not mad at you. Don't you be mad at Him. <laughs> God took care of your sin debt. You don't have to be afraid of God. You don't have to run from God. You don't have to hide from God. Uh, Y'all have heard me say many, many times, and you'll hear me say it many, many more times. Romans 5.8 is my favorite verse of Scripture. It says, But God commendeth His love toward us, and that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. I didn't have to straighten up, fly right, become a good boy, and do everything right, and, and start you know, behaving correctly for God to save me. Jesus died for me knowing that I was a sinner. And that's why He died for me. So God was reconciled to us by the death of His Son. We can be reconciled to Him the moment we believe. And so that's our ministry. That's what we have. That's the gospel. That's the, the way we have to approach folks and let folks know how they can be saved. Uh, you all know I'm, I'm dealing with cancer. And uh, before I ever got cancer, I would say this and, and talk about this. If someone had the cure for cancer, wouldn't you want to shout it from the housetops? Wouldn't you want to go tell every, especially all those you knew who had cancer, wouldn't you want to go tell them, hey, there's a cure. Here it is. Well, isn't death and eternity without God a whole lot worse thing than cancer? And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, do you not have the cure for sin and death and hell? You do. And so God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. Now we continue on. Look at verse 21. And this kind of sums it all up. For He, God the Father, hath made Him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him, in Christ. Isn't that a wonderful passage of Scripture? Isn't that a wonderful verse? And so he tells us again that we have been given the ministry of reconciliation, verse 18. We, he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Uh, we know that we are, verse 20, ambassadors for Christ, God's representatives on earth with the gospel, the ministry of reconciliation, the gospel of Christ that saves today. And uh, the bottom line of all that is that He, God the Father, made Him, God the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin. The sinless Son of God became sin for us on that cross. And then he goes on to say that we might. And sometimes we, we don't pay attention to words or we misunderstand. Uh, sometimes when we use the word might in our conversation, well, well I, I might go for a ride this afternoon. Depends on how bad the deer flies are. Or how hot it gets this afternoon. 
I might. So it's a maybe, you know, it's a possibility. But here in this passage of Scripture, Mike, and, and most of you are of an age. Y'all remember that cartoon when we were little? Mighty Mouse? Yeah. Here he comes to save the day. You know, Mighty Mouse. Well, that's the idea of Mike. I'm looking at these young people. Y'all probably never heard of Mighty Mouse, have you? No, y'all don't have a clue who Mighty Mouse is. Uh, so uh, y'all y'all had a... Uh, yeah, you grew up with Ren and Stimpy, not Mighty Mouse, and uh, and so uh, uh, there you go. All right, but now uh, so he comes in that says that we might, in other words, that we would have the power, the might. It's not a maybe so. It's not a possibility kind of thing. It's the idea of might, of power, and so he says, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might that we would have the power to be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Folks, that's wonderful news. That causes us who are saved to rejoice. And it also gives us who are saved a ministry and a word that we can go share with others. Jesus loves you. He died for you. He paid all your sin debt. And all you have to do is trust Him and Him alone and not what you do, for your salvation. Folks, that's wonderful news. And that'll save anybody. Alright, I, I got about 17 minutes. Hurry up, Sam. Alright, back to uh, 1 Timothy. I, I'm, I'm really going to do my best to keep this thing within an hour's time. Alright, so we get to back to 1 Timothy chapter 2. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. So, we want you to trust Christ if you haven't. And if you have trusted Christ, we want you to understand your ministry of reconciliation that you're an ambassador for Christ and go share the gospel with others. And then the second part is that God our Savior who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now again, we talked about the horses and you bought the horse. You became a horse person. But now you've got a lifetime of learning about care for that horse and tack for that horse and, and how to ride that horse and how to... How to, how to be safe on the trails and just all the things that, you know, feeding and just everything that has to do with horses. And, uh, uh, you know, we have that saying, uh, you know how to make a small fortune. Start with a big one and buy a couple of horses, you know. <laughs> and uh, we, all, we all understand that to be the truth. And so, it, but it's, it's a lifelong thing to come unto the knowledge of the truth. As we study the Word of God and very much the ministry that, that we have here is, uh, my desire is that you learn to understand the truth of the Word of God for yourself. And that you learn to lay down uh, the religious tradition and baggage that has been imposed of you, on many of you throughout your church life. There's a whole lot of things that people say in pulpits uh, that just aren't true when it comes to the Word of God. There's a whole lot of stuff that people put on you that just aren't true according to the Word of God. Another one of those things that I say all the time, you've heard me say it before and you'll hear me say it hundreds more times, and that is this. Most people in the pew are ignorant of the Word of God, and most preachers like it that way. So you go to a certain church, a certain denomination, a certain name hangs out front, and you expect to hear certain things. You don't know whether that's Bible truth or not for many people. Well, our desire here is, it's just like we t we're reading here, God's will is that all men be saved, and then once they're saved, that they come unto the knowledge of the truth. And folks, you won't get the knowledge of the truth from a denomination. You won't get the, denomin the, the knowledge of the truth from a commentary. You won't get the knowledge of the truth from a Christian college or a Bible college or a seminary. There's only one place to get the knowledge of the truth. And that's in this old black book, or red or brown or whatever colors your mind be. This old King James Bible that I preach and teach from, that's where you're going to get the knowledge of the truth. And so it's a lifelong time of studying and believing what the Word says, where it says it, to whom it says it. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. And uh, again, back to your left to the book of Ephesians, chapter 3. You were in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, then you have Galatians, 
and then you have Ephesians. And so this coming unto the knowledge of the truth. Well, coming, coming unto the knowledge of the truth requires, you know, a number of things that over a lifetime. First of all, it's learning how to study the Bible. The Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, Paul tells us we are to study. And by the way, in your King James Bible, you're told to study two places. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, where it says, Much study is a weariness of the flesh. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where it tells us to study the word of truth. Uh, if you don't have a King James Bible, you don't have the word study there. I wonder who didn't want that word in there. I believe if we're going to come into the knowledge of the truth, we have to study the Word of God. And so he tells us how in 2 Timothy 2.15. He says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Again, I could go in there and spend a lot of time in the verse. But the idea is that we're to study and we're to rightly divide the Word of truth. That's how we come unto the knowledge of the truth. We have to understand that God told different people different things at different times. And so when we open our Bible, we ask the question, who was writing what to whom and when was it written? Who was the author and what was the ministry of the author? And who was the audience? Who was the author writing to? And so like we said, God told different people different things at different times. If we don't understand that, we'll never understand our Bible. I got this timeline on here and I always refer to this thing and I say, Adam had so much information and then Noah got more information and Noah got different information than what Adam had. And then from then we have Abraham shows up on the scene, Abram, and he gets new and different information that Noah never had. And that thing continues right on through Moses and then the kings and the prophets and John the Baptist and the twelve apostles and uh, Stephen and Paul, or Stephen and Philip in the early Acts, and then Paul, and right on out through there. And so we have to ask ourselves the questions again. Who was writing what to whom and when? What was their ministry? And then believe the words on the page. Folks don't believe the words on the page. They just gloss over. And so he says, God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And just like it is with our horses, we acquire the horse or a mountain bike or a motorcycle or whatever it is, and then we spend a lifetime coming unto the knowledge of the truth about that thing. Well, the same way it is in our Bible. And so when I went to Ephesians chapter 3, because uh, I want to emphasize there and then wrap this thing up. All right. So in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, Paul writes the letter of Ephesians uh, after he's been arrested uh, after he spent some time in that Roman prison, uh, he, he, wrote, he, he wrote certain books while he was doing his missionary journeys, and we read those and understand those during that time. And then he wrote what we call the prison epistles, and uh, Ephesians is one of those, probably written later on toward the end of Paul's life. And, so, uh, and that's an important distinction. As you come on Monday night, you'll learn why those things are important. All right. And so, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul gives us some information, and, uh, and it's very much an important part of coming unto the knowledge of the truth. All right, so he says here, For this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote a forward few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And so let me take the parentheses out and go back to verse 3 and read with the parentheses out and carry on the thought. So verse 3, How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ by the gospel, whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power, unto me who am the least, who, unto me who am the least, the, who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now verse 9. 
and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now boy, there's a lot of doctrine and a lot of stuff in there. But where I want to zero in here, again, because I'm, I'm really going to be a good boy and watch my time. All right. And so, uh, and so what I want to zero in here is where you get to verse 9, uh, verse, excuse, yeah, verse 9, where Paul says that, uh, uh, that, that his ministry there, and this is the ministry that helps us to come unto the knowledge of the truth, it's to come to that place where Paul says he wants to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. And so again, a mystery is a secret. And there was a secret that God had concerning us today in the church, the body of Christ. This dispensation of the grace of God that Paul talks about here at the beginning in, in, verse, uh, in verse 2 of Ephesians 3. And so Paul has dealt with mankind through dispensations throughout uh, since the time of creation. And so we had a dispensation of innocence and a dispensation of, of promise, a dispensation of innocence, a dispensation of promise, a dispensation of the law, a dispensation of the kingdom, and we have the dispensation of the grace of God. And so we live in that dispensation of the grace of God, and in that dispensation, God would have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth, and coming unto the knowledge of the truth is coming to an understand this mystery, this secret that was hidden in the heart and mind of God since before the foundation of the world that He never revealed until He revealed it to Paul the Apostle, and Paul began to share those secrets, those mysteries with us as he wrote to us in Romans through Philemon. And so that's why Paul says there in Ephesians, verse 9 again, that part of his ministry in, in us coming unto the knowledge of the truth is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ, and to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now, is it the will of God that all men be saved? Yes. Amen. Is that the most important thing? That's the most important thing. I always say, if you're having a conversation with somebody, and in that conversation you realize they're probably lost, they probably never trusted Christ, uh, they're trusting in their religion, they're trusting in their works, they're trusting in what they're doing, either that or they just never trusted anything and they don't care, they're just old heathens, you know. If you come to a place where you realize they're probably lost, does it matter if they come unto the knowledge of the truth? Yes. Not when it comes to doctrine. What's the most important thing? The gospel. And so I can argue with somebody about eternal security. I can argue with somebody about uh, the King James Bible. I can argue with somebody about Paul being our apostle. I can argue with somebody about the difference between law and grace and kingdom and church and prophecy and mystery. I can have those conversations and argue and show them from Scripture why I believe what I believe. But if I convince them that what I'm saying is true from the Word of God, but they're still lost, doesn't matter, does it? I mean, a, die who, a guy who goes to hell knowing Paul's, in his, Paul's his apostle... Well, who cares? He's lost. So the most, most important thing is God our Savior who will have all men to be saved. The most important thing is that folks trust Christ. most important thing we can be about in our Christian living is to share the gospel as the doors of opportunity open up for us. And, and so we need to learn to do that and we need to be faithful to do that. Share the gospel. we got folks dying of sin and they don't have to. They're separated from God, and they don't have to be. We've got the answer, and it's in the person and work of Christ. When He died for our sins, was buried and raised again for our justification. <laughs> and then that all men come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so when we're talking to a believer, our desire then is to share with them the fellowship of the mystery. And to understand what that is. 
and to study our Bibles. God wants us to come unto the knowledge of the truth. He wants us to be saved. Amen. But He doesn't want us to stay babes in Christ. We have a baby, and uh, when that baby is newborn, we expect that baby to poop his pants. We expect that baby to cry when they want to be fed. We expect that baby to cry when it wants to be held. All the things that babies do, right? We don't expect that baby to be able to, to, to talk to us. Uh, we don't expect that baby to eat solid food. Uh, you know, and so, so we watch that baby grow. There comes a time when now we, uh, you know, you get that first smile or that first giggle. Isn't that a wonderful thing? We enjoyed that with our first kids, and we enjoyed it even more with the grandkids. <laughs> of course, we can send them home, you know. Uh, sugar them up and send them home. Uh, so, so we understand those things. And so when a believer first comes to faith in Christ, they're like that newborn babe. But now if that child is now three years old, or five years old, or ten years old, and that baby at, at five and ten years old is still pooping its pants, we're concerned. If that baby at five and ten years old is still can't communicate, we're concerned. You know, all the things. And there was just this natural maturity we expect to take place. So God our Savior wills that all men be saved, that He also wills that after you're saved that you come unto the knowledge of the truth. And there's only one way to come into the knowledge of the truth, and that's by studying the book. You won't get it through osmosis. It doesn't just happen. You have to do it on purpose, just like raising children. You have to teach them on purpose. We potty train our children. We gradually move our children from milk to baby food to solid food. Well, that's the way it is for us as believers. We are to come unto the knowledge of the truth. And so now, as we go about this ministry uh, and having our Sunday morning messages, our purpose will be to preach the gospel and to teach the Word of God in such a way that all men will be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's what the ministry will be about. We'll, you'll hear the gospel about every Sunday. Now, Brother Sam, is that all you're going to preach is the gospel? No. But you know what? I never know who's sitting in front of me. And do you think that I might have a responsibility that if they're here and I got the Word of God, what should I do? Share the gospel. I get, y'all may or may not pay attention to this, and I know, don't talk chasing rabbits, Sam. I go to funerals, and you know what I'm listening for at a funeral? I'm listening for the gospel. I want to know if that preacher sitting there with folks who have death on their mind, who have eternity on their mind, I want, <laughs> I want to know if those folks have ever heard the gospel. And I want to give them the gospel. Do you know how disappointed I am when I go to a funeral and the preacher gets up and talks about Jesus and talks about heaven and talks about... But they never tell folks how to be saved? What a frustrating thing. And so when you come, at some point in the line, at some point in the message, I'm going to say the gospel is that Christ died for your sins, was buried, and raised again for your justification. If you'll simply trust Christ, you can be saved right where you're sitting. Somewhere in my message, I'll say that. The beginning, the middle, the end. Somewhere I'm going to say that probably about every Sunday. And then every Sunday, I want to teach the Word of God and present the Word of God so that we're coming unto the knowledge of the truth. And again, the analogy I give is this. When you started grade school, you know, we're going to talk about math for just a minute. When you started grade school, the first thing you had to learn was your numbers. And then as you progressed through grade school, then you learned how to add those numbers. And then you progressed, you learned how to subtract. And eventually you learned how to multiply and divide. And, and if you stayed there long enough, you eventually took those classes whether you learned anything or not. You took those classes where you learned, where you were taught algebra or uh, geometry uh, or, you know, whatever the advanced math might be. Way on up to all that crazy stuff that I don't have any knowledge about. But the point is that you started with basic things and you move forward. You don't expect a second grader to do algebra. 
right? They got to learn how to add and subtract and multiply and divide first before they can add decimals and fractions and, and then X equals whatever, you know. All right, so with all that being said, coming unto the knowledge of the truth is the same way. So the encouragement will be to come. Hear the gospel. Share the gospel with others. Bring folks with you so they can share, hear the gospel. Bring folks with you so that in hearing the gospel, they can also, and you also, can come unto the knowledge of the truth. And it'll be a gradual, progressive thing of instruction and learning. Don't be frustrated about what you don't know. Because that's easy to do. Don't be discouraged about what you don't know. Because the answer is, you can know one step at a time. One bite at a time. And so that's what we'll be about here. God's will is that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. That's what we want to be about in this place. Thank you all for your attention. And we'll have a word of prayer. I forgot to sing our Roy Rogers song. Yeah, I forgot, to, I forgot that in all my doings. Uh, but we will uh, finish up and sing that and, uh, and have a word of prayer. All right, I'm going to stop the video. Thank you all on video.